January 17, 1991. F-16 streaked toward Iraq. And I kept thinking, I just kept saying this, any minute now there'll be a terminate wolf back, terminate wolf back. It just, it, this is not happening. Somebody's going to stop this. The closer and closer and closer we got to the Iraqi-Kuwaiti border, I kept saying, nobody's going to stop this. regular army are deployed in tiers north of the Saudi border, while at least 1,600 tanks, backed by 40,000 troops, face the coast. They raped the woman and the child, then they shot the man in the head. These tortures went on daily. Yesterday, the noon deadline passed without the agreement of the government of Iraq to meet demands of United Nations Security Council Resolution 660 as set forth in the specific terms spelled out by the coalition to withdraw unconditionally from Kuwait. The liberation of Kuwait has now entered a final phase. I have complete confidence in the ability of the coalition forces swiftly and decisively to accomplish their mission. January 1991. American commanders returned to Saudi Arabia after briefing President George Bush on their battle plan to liberate the tiny Gulf Kingdom of Kuwait. Nearly all of the generals leading American forces in the Gulf are veterans of the defeat in Vietnam. Every decision made reflects this and is the antithesis of the way the war in Southeast Asia was fought. In Vietnam, American air power was applied with intermittent bombing halts meant to encourage concessions. Here in the Gulf, there will be no such compromises. 158 civilian airliners are commandeered in what becomes the largest airlift in history. In the first six weeks alone, more men and machines are flown into the theater than transported over the entire 18-month span of the Berlin airlift. Unlike Vietnam, a quarter million reservists are called up for the first time since World War II. Now he's getting in there. There we go. Yeah. A total of 25 squadrons, or nearly half of all Air Force combat units in the U.S., fly non-stop to Saudi Arabia. Uh, single ship. Uh, no, I've got three of them, two on the coast side, one up, one in the middle. Among these are 140 F-16 Fighting Falcons. The Falcon will be the workhorse of an Allied air assault that will mark a turning point in combat aviation history. The F-16 Fighting Falcon, initially designed as a lightweight, short-range day fighter meant to oppose Soviet aircraft in Europe, has evolved into one of the most effective fighter aircraft the world has ever seen. Falcons are capable of pulling 9 Gs, meaning that in high-speed combat turns, a pilot weighing 200 pounds can suddenly weigh 1,800. The cockpit seat is reclined at a sharper angle than in any other fighter, which keeps blood from pooling down into the pilot's legs and makes it less likely that he'll black out while flying as fast as 1,400 miles an hour. January 16th. By the eve of battle, nearly 250 F-16 stand poised in the Gulf to take on the fourth largest army in the world. I have pledged that this will not be another Vietnam. And let me reassure you here today, it won't be another Vietnam. They had a policy in Vietnam of gradual escalation. A lot of targets off limits gradually put on, on the target list, but never really were given the opportunity to use air power to its maximum effectiveness to, to take out uh, the opposition. 
in the Gulf, um, I asked for from the president, got his permission to give him the whole load the first night. That is to say, we put together a comprehensive target list. We let basically our commanders in the field decide what ought to go on that target list. I personally approved, together with General Powell, the categories of targets we wanted to hit. We took that to the president for his approval, too, but we didn't pull any punches. And as we went after everything from the very beginning and, and in order to deliver the most devastating strike possible in terms of maximum impact of air power. So those were, I think, direct lessons that we derived from the Vietnam experience, and, and we tried hard in the Gulf to, to benefit from those lessons. military to leave Kuwait. At midnight on January 17th, the American war machine is set into motion. In the U.S. command bunker near Riyadh, American leaders wait nervously after launching the largest single air assault in history. In Vietnam, aviation assets were divided into separate commands. In the Gulf, they are united under the supervision of a tough fighter jock named Chuck Horner. Waiting for the war to start that first night was a real downer. Uh, not only did we know we were going to lose our guys, uh, we didn't know how many, but we knew some would be killed. Uh, but we also knew that we were going to embark on the taking of a lot of lives, a lot of Iraqi lives. And I don't know of any military person who takes joy in war. Certainly we didn't that first night. I had great confidence in our ability of our forces to do what they said they were going to do. What we didn't know, what nobody knew, was how costly it would be. And we always assumed the first night of the air war would be the most dangerous and the most difficult, that we'd lose our most uh, largest number of pilots that night because the air defenses and the air force on the Iraqi side would be at its maximum level of capabilities. And uh, I spent that night in the office. 2.30 a.m. F-117 stealth fighters pave the way for a furious assault that will leave no region of enemy territory untouched. In the span of 45 minutes, nearly 700 coalition aircraft streak into Iraq. The strike force is timed to hit over 100 vital targets simultaneously. The secret to success in Desert Storm in the air campaign side were the tasks we accomplished in the early days of the war. The first thing we did was seize control of the air. That was fundamental to everything else. Gaining control of the air means eliminating Iraq's formidable SAM, or surface-to-air missile threat. Of the enemy's 15,000 heat-seeking and radar-guided SAMs, some of the most troublesome are those based in occupied Kuwait. Here, the F-16 Fighting Falcon will play a crucial role. To defeat Iraq's SAMs, this modern warplane will rely on surplus munitions from the Vietnam War. American pilots will use this combination of dated and modern weaponry to face down an Iraqi air defense system known as CARI. Designed by the French, it is an elaborate system of early warning radars, SAM missile sites, and ground control bunkers, which will direct 275 Iraqi fighters onto incoming Allied aircraft. As the first night of war gives way to morning, the Falcon pilots of the South Carolina Air National Guard set out to destroy the 10 enemy SAM sites covering occupied Kuwait. I had been selected to be the mission commander to lead the 20 aircraft into Kuwait and knock out these SAMs, and so I felt a tremendous uh, sense of responsibility since the success or failure of the mission and the survivability of our aircraft would depend a great deal on how effective the plan I had developed turned out to be. If unsuccessful, the skies of Kuwait will remain a death trap for the second wave of American airmen set to follow. We launched uh, very early that morning, uh, and I'll never forget that. It was a beautiful day, uh, gorgeous. Yep, sir, I'm 143, go ahead. 
coming from where we were, uh, we had over three hours of flying to do just to get to our target. During that time, we had to air refuel a couple of times. One, two, three, you're right. I'm on your right wing. Just stay over there until I come back to that wing. It seemed like uh, another training sortie, like we had flown uh, hundreds of times before. Except this time, you look out on your wings, and no kidding, those are live bombs out there. And, and here's uh, seven other F-16s flying with you uh, in formation, going in to bomb this target. Yeah, it looks real dandy up to the north. I said we'll be able to bomb, but it won't be pretty. for himself, his wingman, and another flight of two to enter enemy airspace well ahead of the rest of the squadron. This small vanguard will then take out the two most forward Iraqi SAM sites in Kuwait. With enemy defenses awakened, the survivors will then push deeper into enemy territory and act as decoys, drawing Iraqi radars with them. The 16 undetected Falcons trailing behind will then blast the eight remaining missile sites. As we hit the Kuwaiti border, I remember thinking at the time that this doesn't seem too bad. So far, nothing was shooting at us, and none of us had any indication of enemy radar activity on our radar warning receiver. And so I thought to myself that they didn't know we were coming. You go in, and all this anticipation, all this buildup, you're ready to do it. The pressure's on, the heat's on, and your fingers are working a little faster, and, and the radar's moving a little faster because you're making it go too fast and all this kind of stuff. And you get in there, and you get so busy, the butterflies go away. Seconds after crossing the border, the first two Iraqi SAM sites are destroyed. It is the only part of the mission that goes as planned. Iraqi SAM crews quickly spot the main Falcon strike force trailing behind. We pulled off of the target and uh, headed to the north, climbed back to uh, the mid-20 altitude. I'm on the western side of Kuwait. My individual two ships have now split and going towards their targets. Head 220. Head 220. Head 220. Head 220. Head Simultaneously, almost every one of my 20 F-16s was engaged by SAMs. Guys are screaming on the radio uh, for the SAM breaks, and with one turn of my head, I see about 30 or 40 smoke trails crisscrossing the sky, and off in the distance, there's big black puffs of smoke, and I, at the time, did not know whether each one of those represented a lost F-16. I had a frequency pre-planned for all the fighters to come up once we were back in friendly territory. And uh, as I pushed over to that freak, I, I couldn't bring myself to check the flight in. I had a knot in my stomach and a lump in my throat. I, I was very concerned about what I would find because I was not sure how many of my fellow aviators were down in Kuwaiti airspace. It remains one of the more special moments in my life when I gave the command to check in and one at a time 20 F-16s checked in. across the border and if there's just like this is a tremendous release of, of, of all this energy that's been built up and you, and you just kind of you drop your shoulders and you take a breath and then you, you're back to business again and you start looking around okay I'm all, all the pieces are still on my airplane and uh, okay there's my buddies they're all here we start checking in on the radios and making sure everybody nobody has any damage we do a battle damage check on each other to make sure there's been that nobody's been hit Prior to the war, the South Carolinians were rated in international competition as the world's best ground attack unit. Above Kuwait, they prove why. 
knocking out all ten Iraqi SAM sites with no losses. I will tell you, as soon as you come back across the border, is actually the times I was uh, scared the most. Because then you would kind of go, oh my God, what did I just fly through? And uh, all those missiles and all those bullets, the 57 millimeter, uh, AAA, the anti-aircraft artillery was just enormous. Uh, you could see the, the stuff on CNN. Well, uh, we were looking at it from a different direction. We're coming in from the top of it. Y'all were seeing it from the bottom side of it. When I got up the next morning, they brought in the, the results, and by then all the planes had returned except one. We'd only lost one aircraft in that first night's raid. Remember, we were also products of the Vietnam press. Uh, had the attitudes that maybe we weren't as good as anybody else, so on and so forth. So when the missions were successful and the airplanes returned safely, there was a great deal of euphoria broke out in our command headquarters, and people were talking and joking and, and carrying on. Uh, I did my best to put a squash on that, because I knew that war isn't its highs and lows, its ups and downs emotionally, but most of all, it's hard work. You don't know what goes on in, a, in the mind of a man like that. I do believe we'll be unrelenting until they get out of Kuwait. So continue. Uh, let's be careful about complacency. Uh, please continue. Yeah, we had a lot of euphoria right at first, but then it settled down into routine of going to work every day and getting the job done. Uh, but there's no reason to have somebody be a POW or killed. targets throughout Iraq and Kuwait are damaged or eliminated. F-117 stealth bombers, precision-guided munitions, and cruise missiles form the backbone of an assault that simultaneously takes out command bunkers, power stations, radar defenses, telephone exchanges, bridges, and fuel dumps throughout the region. Despite this, Saddam Hussein escapes attacks on his bunker. Still, the intensity and speed of the onslaught sends Iraq reeling. It will never recover. The comparison, if you will, with, a, with, with the paralysis with shock is to think about what happens to the human body when it takes a whole series of wounds uh, 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 across the, the in, entire body. Any one of the wounds may not in itself be particularly a, a problem, but if they happen in a time-compressed manner, then they have a tendency to produce shock. And that shock can either, either lead to paralysis or, in many cases, it will lead to death, even though the individual wounds in themselves are far from being fatal. And that's basically what we did to Iraq. That's really my concern today. Yeah. The professionalism of the American Air Force is born out of the massive defense buildup of the Reagan years. It marks an incredible turnaround for an organization that found itself broken and discredited following the debacle in Vietnam. The 80s allowed us to train every day. You know, every Monday we came back and got back on those jets and went back out and flew again. We have a saying in this business, and I didn't make it up, and it goes way, way back, but there's, there's, there's no uh, replacement for air under your butt. No uh, academic classrooms can replace air under your butt. And uh, you get these young guys out there flying 18 to 21 times a month, and they get good. And they get good in a hurry. And they get competent, and they get capable, and they become flight leads. They become instructor pilots. Getting shot at was not near as much fun as I had thought it was going to be. Uh, we landed.
landed at our base, and as I pulled in, I pulled into the hot pits, and they pumped gas and filled the airplane back up, and as I went to my parking spot, before I turned the motor off, I felt the airplane start rocking, and I looked out the window, and they were slapping bombs on it. As I climbed down the ladder, told the crew chief the jet was code one, and started to walk to the tent, the next pilot was passing me going back north. We continued that for 39 straight days. up. Jernigan's unit alone drops over four million pounds of ordnance on the Iraqis below. By war's end, men in Falcon cockpits complete more missions and drop more bombs than any other pilots of the war. Before the war began, Saddam Hussein talked about air power, and he said that Iraq had experience with air power, and they had experience with American air power, I guess, because they figured Iran flew some American planes. And then they would ride out the air campaign, and then he anticipated there would be a, a grisly ground war. And Iraq's strategy was to ride out the air campaign, engage in a ground war, rack up a sufficient number of American casualties that the American public would become... Uh, discontent and unhappy with the ground war and a political compromise would be reached. And you think about uh, about the the willingness and the ability of say the both the French, the British and the, and the Germans in World War One to accept 50, 60, 100,000 casualties on a single day that led to nothing more than a change of a few hundred yards or a mile or something on a line on the ground. Uh, I anything that was even remotely like that today would, would, would cause a government to fall. People simply are not willing to make those kinds of, of human blood investments unless their very lives depend on it. The only bloodbath is the one that drowns the Iraqis themselves. The Iraqis expect the bombing campaign to last days. Instead, it goes on for five weeks. And this is my counterpart's headquarters in uh, Baghdad. <laughs> this is the air, uh, headquarters of the Air Force, and keep your eye on all sides of the building as the airplane overflies the building and drops the bomb down through the center of the building. Air Force briefers inoculate the American public with an antiseptic show of smart bombs, stealth planes, and precision guided munitions. To the people at home, the war becomes a bloodless video game. But the CIA estimates that as many as 150,000 enemy troops die on the desert floor below. Airmen fly three and four missions a day, maintaining an intensity unmatched since Vietnam. The strain is expected to create a maintenance nightmare. Instead, Falcon ground crews keep 95% of their aircraft combat ready for the duration of the conflict. It is an incredible feat for an Air Force that hasn't fought a major war in 20 years. Uh, some of the things that I told them, you know, we can make some mistakes back at, down in Georgia and South Carolina when, you know, you're out of formation. But if you make a mistake here, and you may not be coming back. Or I might not be coming back. We started out the first couple of days of the war, and we pretty much said, let's go with our heavy hitters on the first couple missions. You know, before we go dragging these guys, I mean, some of these guys have more combat time than they've got peacetime flying. They came right out of school, right out of the, the, the training unit, and boom, they're in the squadron. We stamp a mission ready certificate on them after about 12 flights, and they're in a war. The next week, they're in a war. No amount of training can prepare young men for a job that often calls for the destruction of civilian industrial targets. I can see my target, I can see my specific uh, area that I'm responsible for hitting. Rolling in, releasing the bombs and coming off target. Uh, and then 
you stop to think, well, you know, here's this factory, this oil refinery down there, and you know, you know, unfortunately, one of the inevitabilities of war, people are going to get killed. Uh, I could remember seeing all those bombs going off, the first ones, Leeds bombs, hitting the ground, uh, and things beginning to explode and the target crumbling. And you, there's a parking lot full of cars there, and you know the place has got people in it, but, uh, uh, you know, you got a mission to do. That was our specific target, and, and that's what uh, we were fragged to, to destroy. Um, but you couldn't help but wonder, you know, for those people stuck inside. You know. Good intentions seldom hold up in the chaos of war. Early in the conflict, faulty intelligence leads to the destruction of a bunker sheltering civilians. An F-117's 2,000-pound laser-guided bomb takes the lives of nearly 400 Iraqi men, women, and children. These images pose a public relations nightmare to American leaders. Over the course of the struggle, the rules of engagement are clear. Excessive civilian deaths are to be avoided. By and large, this edict holds. At war's end, the huge amount of ordnance dropped accounts for 2,700 civilian deaths. Prior to the war, our commanders, all the way up to Sintaf headquarters, reiterated to us that without positively identifying the target we were going after or the airborne aircraft we were going after as a military target, they would rather we bring our bombs home rather than cause collateral civilian damages. I take an oath to defend my nation and to fight for my nation. I assume I, I grant the, the enemy that we're facing no less than that same oath. And so if he takes my life or I take his, then that is a decision each of us can live with. Uh, being relieved of the responsibility of having to go in and possibly live with a large-scale civilian casualties, I was very grateful for. Captured American pilots are valuable currency to the enemy. Will you give your name and rank? U.S. commanders are intent on denying Saddam this kind of political leverage. Orders are issued that keep the Falcon above 10,000 feet. At such height, the pilot is safe, but the plane nearly impotent. When we were doing the initial planning, we had assumed that airplanes like the F-16 airplanes, smart airplanes dropping dumb bombs, would have better success than they were able to have. Uh, as it turned out, though, uh, trying to drop uh, bombs from, uh, from, from 15, 20,000 feet, as the, as the tactical situation really demanded for the F-16s, turned out to be a very, very difficult problem. Uh, and a good illustration of why it was a problem comes in something that nobody in the past had worried about particularly, and that is the, the ballistics of the bomb itself. The bomb itself has a six mil built-in random error. That means that for every thousand feet of distance from the target, that the bomb, from pure aerodynamic reasons, may wander uh, off six feet from where it's going. So at 10,000 feet, that's 60 feet. At 20,000 feet, that's 120 feet. And the pilot has absolutely no control over that. Every 10 Falcon bombs fail to strike on target. As the ground war approaches, U.S. commanders begin to demand greater accuracy. Falcon pilots are forced into bombing runs that take them closer to the deck than ever before. Later, the enemy ignites countless oil wells to obscure his movement below, and 16s must dive into approaches that take them beneath the black clouds of smoke. You felt very vulnerable. It's just a vulnerable feeling. And you could look down, you could see these AAA pieces, you see the muzzle flashes, and I'd look up as we're coming off target and notice that a lot of these ground bursts, uh, explosions were going off above us. I couldn't help but think of just one lucky aim or one lucky bullet is all it would take to, uh, to bring you down. Back in the control bunker in Riyadh, Air Force leaders steel themselves for the losses that will surely follow these new tactics. I, uh, I... I think all of us who are involved in command in Desert Storm carry a real fear 
We have to make decisions that can lead to the loss of lives. And if we make the wrong decisions, more lives are lost than if we'd made the right decision. Military guys, particularly fighter pilots, have learned very early in their lives that they're not in control of their lives, that there's higher powers at work. And all you do is do the best you can, uh, know that you're going to make mistakes, but uh, if you don't try the best you can, somebody else has to. So you got the stick, you fly the jet, you do the job. And uh, afterwards, you feel very badly about the things you did wrong. When you make mistakes as a commander, uh, people can second guess you, but that's nothing compared to what you do to yourself. But the loss rate in the Gulf is the lowest in modern history. Less than 2% of Allied combat aircraft fall to Iraqi gunners, a statistic of little comfort to the men downed over enemy territory. Five Falcons are lost over Iraq, and three F-16 pilots fall into enemy hands. In February, while on a routine recce mission, Captain Bill Andrews embarks on a mission that would last the duration of the war. On my mission on 27 February, my flight was designated to uh, provide close air support for the 18th Airborne Corps. We uh, dropped down uh, underneath a 10,000 foot ceiling looking for the uh, targets that had uh, been called out to us. And uh, as we uh, circled over the area, I think I made about a, uh, oh, about a 270 degrees worth of turn when my wingman called back, hey, I think I see something. I circled back around to uh, take a look at it. It was a few Iraqi vehicles uh, moving along the road. I was uh, getting ready to uh, call for permission to hit those vehicles when uh, my F-16 was uh, hit by what I believed to be a surface-to-air missile, probably an infrared-guided one because I didn't get any warning. When the missile hit my airplane, it was just such a shock. I couldn't even understand what was happening. One minute I was looking over the edge of my uh, canopy at the ground looking at some Iraqi uh, vehicles. The next second, there was just a tremendous explosion and a huge impact uh, from behind me. Canopy went, and uh, I was uh, kicked right out of the airplane by that uh, by the ejection seat. And uh, as I was looking down, I saw uh, tracers coming by uh, my side. I looked over my shoulder, and somebody was uh, firing a 23 millimeter uh, anti-aircraft gun in my uh, direction. Luckily, uh, they weren't much of a shot that day. I think I started yelling on my radio, hey, they're, they're shooting at me. I had about a five or six minute parachute uh, descent down to the ground, and I could see uh, Iraqis coming towards me a, a few hundred yards away. And uh, I hit pretty hard. Um, when I hit the ground, I, I tried to get up, and I immediately flopped over. It turned out my uh, leg had my leg had been broken uh, just above the boot. Andrews soon finds himself headed for Baghdad with other captured Allied pilots. Today, American pilots fly an aircraft that retains the strengths which have made it one of the best fighters the world has ever seen. Externally, the F-16C is very similar to the older A model that preceded it. A limited number of these served in the Gulf and were the only Falcons capable of operating at night or delivering laser-guided munitions on their own. The canopy hits the pilot at waist level, seating him higher than in most fighters and providing an unsurpassed field of vision in every direction. Older Falcons relied mainly on the pilot's eyes to spot threats. The F-16C marks a quantum leap in BVR, or beyond visual range, technology. Inside the cockpit, pilots use a wide-angle heads-up display, or HUD, that provides four times the viewing area of earlier models. The most vital aspect of the jet, however, is its single engine. The Pratt & Whitney F-100 is the same as those employed by the F-15. 
nearly smokeless, the power plant provides the pilot with over 25,000 pounds of thrust. On full afterburner, the Falcon can burn the 4,000 pounds of fuel carried in its drop tanks in just 35 seconds. function video screens display avionics data and FLIR imagery that enable the F-16C to operate day, night, or in bad weather. In a dogfight, pilots rely on the radar-guided AIM-7 Sparrow missile. The missile follows the energy signal reflected off the target and can kill from over 45 miles away. At shorter range, Falcon pilots depend on the heat-seeking AIM-9 Sidewinder. This is the AIM-9 Sidewinder missile and a few key items about this heat-seeker missile. Up here located on the nose of the missile is a cavity. Inside here we put an argon uh, bottle. Argon is an inert gas. The bottle is pressurized to 5,000 PSI, and it is used during flight to cool off the electronic systems in the missile to provide a better heat lock on for the uh, uh, target detector. Located just in this section here would be the warhead. Warhead is about 21 pounds of uh, high explosives. It uses what they call an expanding metal rod. The warhead can be detonated in two methods, either by direct impact on the uh, target, or the second method underneath this protective cover is by proximity. And what it'll do is send out a sense of a target flying nearby, and if it's hit close enough, it'll actually detonate the missile automatically. Another area of interest on the aft end of the missile are the roll-around assemblies. There's one located on each uh, wing area. The roll-around assembly acts as a uh, to stabilize the missile in the roll, pitch, and yaw during flight. A key design is this channel, which funnels air down to the roll-around, which spins at high rate and acts as a gyroscope to stabilize the missile during free flight. Upon launch from the aircraft, a small setback weight will come loose and allow the roll-around to move freely about its axis, and it's oil-damped to prevent excess flutter during flight so it will not damage the missile. At 4 a.m. on February 24th, the ground assault begins. The attack is sudden and ferocious. The enemy is dug in behind a series of minefields, razor wire, and oil-filled ditches that they intend to set alight in the face of Allied troops. It is the same defense that blunted hundreds of human wave attacks launched by the Iranians over the course of eight years of war. Fire! But from the outset, the feared Iraqi army never materializes. In many places, the enemy response is uninspired or non-existent. After nearly a decade of struggle against Iran, Saddam's troops are tired of war. For five weeks, they have been pounded from above by an enemy they cannot touch. In the war against Iran, they slept in their tanks for safety. In this war, their tanks become coffins. In the two days following the ground assault, nearly 3,000 sorties are launched against enemy positions. Thousands of Iraqi vehicles are destroyed, and in the first 24 hours, over 75,000 prisoners fall into American hands. Many are starving and shell-shocked. But some in Allied ranks have little sympathy for the depleted condition of their captives. When you have privy to some of the intelligence reports of what they're doing to the Kuwaitis and the Kuwaiti people and the Kuwaiti women and children, uh, I, I have no sympathy. I mean, these guys are really good at beating up on 18-year-old Iranians, okay, in, in a mud fight, but they'd never seen anything like this before, and they got their butts handed to them on a silver platter. And uh, I was, uh, to be honest with you, I, I, I was proud to be a part of it. By February 27th, Saddam's strategy becomes one of flight. Nowhere is this more evident than on the road between Kuwait City and Basra. 
Huge convoys of trucks, tanks, and stolen automobiles race toward Iraq, only to be caught in a deadly bottleneck. When they finally made the run for it, there were a lot of us that uh, were going, well, here's payback time. You know, you sorry rascals, if you hadn't done this to begin with, I wouldn't have been here to begin with. There was no doubt we had them pinned down. The Army was bearing down on them uh, from this side. Uh, they couldn't go that way because of Iran and the, and the ocean, and so they pretty much had to make a beeline towards Basra and home. For the next two days, American F-16s pound the 40-mile stretch of asphalt with ruthless efficiency. It was a lot of flights. Our squadron was uh, basically a two-ship every 20 minutes was on that highway, around the clock. Around the clock. And we weren't the only squadron doing that. Uh, in fact, the airspace became a bit of a problem, you know, uh, trying to get all these uh, airplanes in there. To the newly liberated people of Kuwait, justice is finally served. What do you think when you see all of this? I think they got what they deserve. I still have a humanity. I, I didn't like that they got what they have now, but I think they got what they deserve. I have no regrets whatsoever about any bomb I dropped on that highway. Zero. They bought this war. They started it. They brought it on. And sometimes uh, the, uh, the only way in my mind you're ever going to keep, keep this from happening again is, is you use extreme penalties and extreme force. And, and that may prevent somebody from doing it again. Did we go too far? I don't think so. They say you get as much uh, criticism on the other side that we should have gone farther, we should have gone to Baghdad, or we should have kept the war going for another day or two. Those are judgment calls. I think we made the right call. We'd achieved our objectives. We did what we set out to do. And uh, we did it, uh, I think, in an exemplary fashion. And uh, the Iraqis, of course, always had the option not to have invaded in the first place. They always had the option to have gotten out when we told them to get out. Uh, they had the option to surrender and back off uh, before we actually launched the ground war. They didn't do any of that. And uh, in the end, uh, we did the only thing we could. We used military force to liberate Kuwait and to push the Iraqis back inside Iraq. And, and uh, that was the right thing to do. 100 hours after the ground assault begins, it is over. For the Americans captured in the conflict, a brief nightmare comes to a close. Two Iraqis were standing over the top of me. I think we were all pretty surprised. They just stared at me, didn't know what, didn't know what to make of it. They said, uh, American sheep Piosh, American pilot? I said, yes. They said, uh, the war, it's over. I go, uh, peace? They go, yes, peace. The war was over at 8 o'clock. The price of Kuwaiti liberation is high. Billions of dollars, environmental disaster, as many as 150,000 Iraqi lives, and those of 394 Americans. Four months after fleeing its homeland, the Kuwaiti monarchy is reinstated, its oil again to flow freely to the West. To some, the true nature of the Kuwaiti regime and the war's underlying goals taint a struggle that American leaders packaged as a crusade against tyranny. Now you can say it was about oil, but that doesn't in any way lessen the significance of it or in any way reduce the morality of our cause. Uh, the fact of the matter is you could not afford to have somebody like Saddam Hussein uh, sit astride the Persian Gulf, control the world's supply of oil, and acquire nuclear weapons. And, and uh, you can talk morality all you want, but in my mind, it's not immoral for us to oppose that kind of development. Uh, whether the focal point is oil or isn't oil strikes me as, a, as a, not a moral judgment at all. It was a vital interest to the United States for us to deny him his conquest. And uh, we did it. And we did it with the approval of the American people. And we did it with the approval, of the, I think, of the entire world. 
But the legacy of the Gulf War is not a political one. To most military historians, the significance of Desert Storm is clear. F-16 Falcons form the backbone of one of the most lopsided victories of all time. In less than two months, the warplane accounts for over 13,500 sorties, or nearly a quarter of all the strike missions launched in the conflict. A conflict where, for the first time in history, air power is the primary instrument in bringing about the collapse of one of the largest standing armies in the world. See how you can ride the eternal wave on Next Step. Then computer designs help create futuristic bikes on Beyond 2000. Only on the Discovery Channel. Explore your world.